So this morning, we are going to finish up our series on the message to the seven churches. And we're at our final church this morning, the Church of Laodicea. And before we get into the text, I want to tell you a story. And like any good pastor, I've listened to other pastors. And when other pastors have told stories, and I've gone, I like that story, I wrote it down and I stole it from them. Because they probably stole it from another pastor before. And so I'm just continuing the chain. Well, anyways, back during the circuit riding preacher days, where a preacher would ride on his horse from one city to another city and so forth, there was this preacher who was riding along, and he was riding past a farm. And he noticed the owner of that farm out working in his field, and he made sure to say, good morning, how are you to the to the farmer, and the farmer was a bit gruff and a bit... And the pastor was a bit taken back by that, and he wanted to ask, are you okay, sir? What, why, why the gruffness this morning? And the man said, you preachers have it so easy. We, we work. We work with our hands, and we're working hard, and you, you're riding along on your horse just thinking about God, and that's all you do all day long. And the pastor said, well, sir, you are correct that... Our roles are different and our jobs are different, but uh, do you really think that it's easy to think about God all day long? And the farmer said, of course it's easy to think about God all day long. And so the, the preacher said, well, if you can think about God for one minute and not think about anything else, I'll give you my horse. And the farmer said, all right. So the preacher got out his pocket watch and said, go ahead. Ten seconds go by. Twenty seconds go by. And just about as thirty seconds go by, the man says, Now do I get the, hor- the saddle with the horse also? <laughs> it can be very easy to get our minds off of God, can't it? I mean, I mean, we live in this world, and we're not to be of this world, right? But it's so easy to get distracted and to keep our attention on the things that we can see and the things that we interact with and the things that we worry about in this life and in this world. It's so easy to forget that there's something above this world. And it's so easy to get our minds off of God. Am I right? Yeah. And I think that unfortunately that's what's happened here in the church at Laodicea. That the people have just seen the world. And since it's the world that they know, they've focused on it. And since it's the world that they live in, they've kind of adopted it and kind of forgotten God. So that's where we're going to begin with uh, Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. Once again, Jesus begins this letter wanting to communicate with the church who is speaking. In this first part, the Amen, the let it be. What I think could be going on here is this could be a reference to the Septuagint version of Isaiah uh, 65 verse 16. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament and the word translated there in Isaiah 65 is the God of Amen. Uh, The God of Truth is the Hebrew version there but the God of the Amen. And here Jesus is saying, I am that Amen. Is there a, a, a message here, a, a witness once again of the deity of Christ? Now the second title, the faithful and true witness. It's interesting that the witness has two descriptives, the faithful and the true. How many of you have ever had to tell a story about something that happened, and you had to tell it from your perspective, all that you knew about that event, and you were faithful to report everything that you knew about. But 
there were things that you just didn't know. There were background details that you couldn't provide. So you were faithful, but when the rest of the information was presented, there was just more details. Now, how many of you can tell the truth about something, but you kind of leave a few bits of truth out of it, right? So you're being truthful. You're not lying, except maybe you're lying by omission, right? Just saying, maybe it's happened. I'm not accusing. But here, Jesus is saying not only is he the faithful, as in he's presenting everything about it, but he's also the true, as in everything he's presented about it is also true. And finally, the beginning of the creation of God. Laodicea is not far from Colossae. And Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, and Colossians chapter 1 has that beautiful hymn about Jesus being the beginning of God's creation. Not the first creation of God, but the instrument through whom God's creation comes from. Remember that in that letter to Colossians, Paul specifically says, and make sure this letter is read at the church in Laodicea. Does John know this? Does Jesus know this? Is that what's going on here? Interestingly, those of you who have ever asked me these kind of questions and, and so forth, you know that I love the NASB, the New American Standard, and you know that that's the one that I usually go to. I actually have to admit that the NIV makes this pat. I know, right? I'm giving props to the NIV. The NIV actually makes this a little bit easier because that word translated the beginning can also be translated the ruler. And the NIV translates it the ruler of God's creation. And if you ask me, I think that's what's going on here. But uh, regardless, so we have these three titles to once again communicate to the church who is speaking. And then we get to verse 15. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. For years, this passage has been used and taught to teach that there are three temperatures that a person can be. They can be hot, they can be on fire for God, or they can be cold, they can be indifferent, they cannot care about the things of God, or you can kind of be somewhere in the middle of those two things. You can be lukewarm, right? And it's been taught that God would rather you make a clear decision. I'm on fire for God or I'm cold for God. But what's interesting is the way that God, or excuse me, the way that Jesus just said it, I wish that you were either hot or cold. In other words, I wish that some people were cold. That doesn't seem to make sense from God's mouth, would it? That he wishes some people were just cold to him? That doesn't make sense. A lot of sense. What we found with archaeology around this area is that there were two towns near the town of Laodicea. One was known for its hot springs, its mineral hot springs, and that's important that it's not just hot, but it's also mineral laced. The other town nearby was up against a mountain and it had a spring coming out of it, and the water was both cold and delicious. And they had dug aqueducts from both cities to provide water to Laodicea. But as the water traveled, both from the hot springs and from the cold spring, the cold would get warm and the hot would get warm. Now there are people who like to drink room temperature water. And I'm not trying to insult anybody, I just don't understand that. I like a nice class, glass of cold water, or I like a nice cup of hot coffee. And in fact, there's a point where the coffee's not hot enough anymore, and it needs to go into the microwave, or it just needs to be dumped out. I love it when the waitress or waiter comes and puts some more hot into that coffee, right? <clears throat> now, what Jesus is about to say is amazing to me. Verse 16, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus is saying to the church, 
You are so disgusting in my mouth, I'm about to spit you out. That is some of the harshest language that we've heard from Jesus at this point in this letter. He's had to deal with sexual immorality. He's had to deal with all sorts of things to this letter and yet, excuse me, to these churches. And yet here, I think we find the most vivid and the most powerful language that Jesus uses to describe a church. You're so gross, I have to spit you out of my mouth. What has this church done that would get Jesus to say that about that church. Let's uh, look at it here in verse 17. Because you say that I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are, excuse me, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Laodicea survived an earthquake in either 60 or 61. And the Roman Empire had need for cities to flourish and survive and so forth. So the Roman Empire had issued bonds for cities to rebuild after this disaster. And many cities needed those funds in order to rebuild. Laodicea had some very, very wealthy citizens in it. And those very, very wealthy citizens created banking opportunities. Laodicea also had a particular type of goat or sheep that had a black wool that was very fine and wanted all over the world, the Greco-Roman world. And it had made the community very wealthy. And the community said to Rome, we don't need your funds, we'll rebuild ourselves. Now, it happens in every city, it happens in every culture the ideas and the concepts of the culture, they want to seep into the church. They want the church to not look like Christ, but to look like the community, to look like them. And has that attitude, has that I don't need your funds, I can take care of myself, has that stepped into this church? Now, Jesus uses, once again, some very strong language that you are wretched and miserable and poor, I don't think that we need to take those literal in the earthly sense of literal because I just told you that they had gotten rich. And so from an earthly perspective, they were doing terrific. Their bankrolls were full. Their coffers were full. They're doing great financially. But the whole purpose of apocalyptic literature is to say there's one way to see the world and there's another way to see the world. You can see the world horizontally, but God sees the world vertically, to put it into human terms, right? And that's what's going on here. And so these next two descriptives, blind and naked, I don't think we need to take these literally. I don't think the church is full of people who can't see, and I don't think the church is full of naked people. And interestingly, there is no other book in the New Testament that has more allusions to the Old Testament. It never actually quotes the Old Testament, which is very interesting, but it has all of these imageries, all of these pictures from the Old Testament. And Jesus is once again imploring some language that we find in the Old Testament. I'm only going to give you two examples. The prophets oftentimes had to stand in the, in the place of a spokesman for God and had to speak to Israel, had to speak to Judah. And in Ezekiel chapter, 13, uh, excuse me, chapter 16, verse 37... The prophet is speaking to the people and he's saying you've prostituted yourself and God is going to expose your nakedness. The same thing happens in Hosea chapter 2 verse 3. There too God is using nakedness as shame and saying that he's going to expose their nakedness. Now I don't think it was literal then. I don't think it's literal now and I don't think it's literal because we're about to see Jesus' remedy for their problem here in our next verse. Verse 18, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may become rich 
and white garments. Remember I told you that the sheep or the goats had black hair and it was very fashionable and wealthy? There's a bit of contrast here with Jesus saying white garments. Here's how the world thinks and here's how I think. And these white garments to clothe yourself so that your, the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Laodicea also had medical advancements. And they had a particular tablet that when it was mixed with that warm water from the mineral hot springs, they would then put it on their eyes and it would relieve some of their eye strain and see, things like that. But Jesus is not saying, go get that. He's saying, get it from me and see it from my perspective. What does that look like? How does that work? Well, I'm going to use one of Jesus' parables that I think perfectly describe what's going on here. You'll remember in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is trying to give people a word picture. What is the kingdom of God like? Well, the kingdom of God is like a man working in a field. So we can imagine that, right? Is he digging in the field? Is he plowing in the field? Whatever he's doing, he's working in this field. This field does not belong to him. So we imagine he takes a shovel and he hears a sound that doesn't sound quite right. And so he investigates and he finds a treasure. And he quickly looks around and nobody is seen. Nobody knows what he's found. And so he covers it back up and he takes a rock to mark the spot. And nobody has seen that he discovered that treasure. And what does he do? Goes home and he gets all, everything that he possesses. And he goes to the marketplace and he sells everything that he has. He's destitute now, but he has that money that he just made. And he goes and he finds the owner of that field, right? You remember this episode. And he uses that money to buy that field. Because everything that he possessed, every possession that he had, all of the commercial value that he could muster was not worth as much as that treasure. And he gives away everything he has in order to buy that field so that he can have that treasure. And I think that that's what Jesus is saying here to the church in Laodicea. Is what you have of greater value or is the knowledge of God and the kingdom of God of greater value? Now I'm not sure, should verse 19 be connected to the rest of this Or should verse 20 be where it splits? I'm not exactly sure, but it seems that Jesus' attention does change at least a little bit, either here in 19 or 20. I'm going to say in 19, he's still speaking to the church. How many of you have ever had somebody you respected, you admired, you loved? How many of you have ever had them have to have a come to Jesus talk with you? Come to Jesus talks are not good, are they? They can be embarrassing, can't they? But are they good, especially when that person is right, to draw some attention to what's been going on in your life, what you've been doing, what you've been thinking about, what you've been saying, how you've been acting? Jesus says to them, Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Church, I love you too much to let you continue to live like this. And what I said there was harsh, but you needed to hear it. Because I need you to be zealous for me, and I need you to repent. This next verse, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. This verse has often been used for evangelism, and I think it's a good verse. Because we tell people that Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. Open the door to him, right? But interestingly, Jesus isn't speaking to the outsider. Jesus isn't speaking to the non-Christian. He's speaking to the church. He's speaking to the Christian. Christian, if you hear me knock, open the door. 
how does Jesus knock? What are ways that we know that Jesus is knocking? I'm going to tell you the one way that I think is undeniable. Are there others? Possibly. But the one way I think is undeniable is God's Word. You read God's Word, you chew on it, you think about it, you put it in your heart. And as you're living your life, you encounter trials, struggles, circumstances. I've been there, I've been sitting there. And my mind goes to something I ever said, something I ever did. And somebody says something out of the Word of God, and it cuts me to the core. And I realize I was wrong to do that. I was wrong to say that. I was wrong to behave that way. I was wrong to do that. And do you know what I do? I curl up into a nice tight ball and I cry. And I think about what a miserable person I am and how much of a failure I am and how can Jesus love a person like me. And you've been there too, right? You've curled up into the fetal position and you just have a pity party, right? But that's not what Jesus said to do, is it? Jesus said to be zealous and to repent. I don't want to downplay all of the sins that we do. When we sin, are we sinning? I'm going to say that one more time. When we sin, are we sinning? Yes. We are sinning when we sin. It makes sense, right? The name is in the name, right? So it's not just a, oh, I just made a little mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. It's okay. No, it was sin. And we need to call sin, sin. But we don't need to stay there on the floor waiting for Jesus to say, okay, you felt bad long enough. You can come back into... No, no, no. Jesus is saying repent. And when we repent, what happens? He forgives us, right? He forgives our sins. And not only does he knock at that door, but he wants us to open that door. And when we open that door, he wants to come in and he wants to have dinner with us. Now in Jesus' day, remember a couple sermons ago, I was telling you that the Pharisees were mad that Jesus was accepting the sinners and the tax collectors to be with him. In Jesus' day, to sit down at the same table with somebody and to eat with them was to say, you and I are equals. I'm not above you. You're not below me. We are equals. And Jesus is saying to the church, I want to have dinner with you. I want to have fellowship with you. I want you to want to have fellowship with me and open that door for me. Look at this next verse because something awesome, something amazing happens in verse 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. The dining room just became a throne room. And Jesus wants to take that fellowship. And here at the end of the book, the end of Revelation, Revelation 20 and uh, excuse me, 21 and 22, something amazing happens. Heaven and earth become one. Remember when we pray the Lord's prayer, we say, "Father, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven." That's a little bit of a foreshadowing. That's a little bit of a wish for what is coming when heaven and earth are one. And we get to sit with Jesus and rule. We get to share with him in that new creation. Are you looking forward to that day? Because I am. Are you looking forward to that day? Because I am. Verse 22. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The same ending at all of the ends of the letters. The same thing saying, church, it's not enough just to hear these words. It's not enough just to sit there and like these words, especially when I just insulted you. How many of you like to be insulted? Go ahead, raise your hand now. I'll keep records. Jesus says it's not enough to just hear. It's you got to do, right? And he's saying this to the church in Laodicea. 
But as the messenger is probably taking these letters to all of the churches, all of the churches are hearing these, right? And they're hearing these, and maybe they're being cut to the quick also, right? And they're saying, that needs to be me too, right? And that's to the church today, and that's to the church here, right? And that's so powerful, that's so amazing, that's so wonderful, but can I share with you I'm a little bit worried? I'm a little bit afraid because there's people that don't know. They're not here this morning. They're out there. They're out there where we interact. They're out there where we live, right? And they don't know what's wrong. And they don't know that if things are wrong, there's a way to make them right. And if they don't know how to make them right, how are they ever going to make them right? And so we could sit here and we could say that this letter is just to us. And we could all have a little bit of guilt and we could all have a little bit of repentance and we could all feel a little bit better by the end, right? Or... We could say that this message is true. This message is true for me. It's true for you. It's true for you. It's true for you. And it's true for them. The ones out there. And do we want them to know this truth? How are we going to communicate that truth to them? How are we going to do it? Love God. Love others. The two commandments, right? Love God, love others. And if you love God, you're going to love others. It's going to happen. Now, is that love the kind of kittens and bubblies and hearts and valentines? Probably not. But you know what that love is? That love is, I love you too much to not let you know. I love you too much, the same way Jesus loves this church. I love you too much to let you keep doing what you're doing. I got to tell you the truth. Church, that's what we got to do. We got to tell them the truth, right? I'd like to invite the worship team to come on back up. I hope that this series has been good. I hope that as we've looked at these churches, we've looked at ourselves. And church, Christian, this morning, if you've heard these words and you've raised your hand and you go, me too, me too, Repent. It's that simple. It's that easy. It's not complicated. Don't sit there and feel guilty until Jesus has decided you felt guilty long enough. Repent. Change the way you're doing things and live the way he would have you live. Now, there might be some here this morning that we're lucky enough that you don't yet have that relationship with Jesus. I promise you he's knocking on the door. I promise you he is. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus can forgive you. And if that's you this morning, don't leave here this morning without talking to me, talk to Steve, talk to Mel. Because we can tell you how you can open that door. Open that door and let Jesus come in.